Here we are. We are in the final week of this series in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, the first letter he wrote to them. We started this series way back after Easter. I think if, if my notes are correct, we started in April 25th. We were still, as you probably are aware, on video only at that time. And that, that seems like a different world almost now, but it wasn't that long ago, right? And we weren't able to meet together in person. We were doing our outside small groups at that time with our good old helicopters flying over and noises and all things, dogs running into our community group as they always do. Uh, but that was back then. Then we got up to August 15th. We were able to start meeting back inside here, which has been a great grace. We were here for three weeks. And then the election, <laughs> recall election, shut us down in here once again. And then we came back up. And now here we are in the first week of October, finishing up uh, this series together. I hope if you've been with Anthology for a while, you've been with us through this series, you have learned more about this letter to this city church that we are looking at. I'll give some more review of the book as a whole, and where we've been. But first, let's read this final chapter together. Most letters in the New Testament that are from Paul or Peter or John or one of the other New Testament writers are very personal at the end. They give lots of greetings to others, and so that's what we're going to see today. So this final message is titled City Greetings for this series. We are going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the whole thing. It'll be on the screen there before me. If you have a bulletin with you, there is a link at the bottom of the bulletin to that. You can put it into your smartphone device, or you can turn in your New Testament if you know where 1 Corinthians is. I think it's, let's see, it's the, the sixth, seventh letter in there? I'm trying to think. Uh, may, don't quote me on that and say, my pastor didn't know where 1 Corinthians was. I know in general where it is, okay? All right, 1 Corinthians 16, we're going to read Paul's final words here. Now concerning the collection, the saints, for the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries." When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise you. Help him on his way in peace. No one despise him, excuse me. Help him on his way in peace that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to visit you with other brothers, but it was not at all, at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer rejoicing at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus. Because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition for such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, the ending of a letter in the New Testament, as I mentioned previously before, is always a great reminder. If you're, again, if you're new to this whole Christianity thing, if you're new to pursuing Jesus and things, the Old Testament is before Jesus and everything happened with the people of God up to that moment, including creation and the fall and why everything's messed up in this world. And then the New Testament is Jesus, him coming, starts with 
Christmas, more or less, and then goes through the story of the early church. And so in the New Testament, we see lots of letters written by people like Paul, and those are great reminders when we see the ending of the letters and we see all these people that we may or may not be familiar with and go, who's that guy? Fortunatus, who, you know, interesting name, (laughs) a fortunate name, if you will. You go, what's going on with this? Well, it's a good reminder that these letters aren't just doctrinal platitudes in general, right? They're not just uh, uh, doctrinal points about who God is and what we need and, and what's going on in the world that are out there in the ether for us to kind of grab and apply to our lives somehow. They're not just God speaking for all ages, for all time, through the apostle, though they are not less than that, okay? These letters are just as relevant for us as God speaking to us as they were back then. However, when we read a letter like this and we see all these people that we may or may not be familiar with, it's a great reminder that these are personal letters written to real people in their own day. People who were followers of Jesus in their own city, in their own families, in their own uh, communities, just like you and I are today here in Studio City with your own friends, own family, own workplaces, or whatever neighborhood you might be in. These people are, of course, that we read about here, some of the companions that Paul has, but the main letter is still written to this young church in Corinth. Again, if you've been with us throughout this series, Corinth is a a reminder. Corinth is an influential, progressive port city for its day. Lots of trade, lots of financial interactions going on that made the city very prosperous in the Roman Empire at that time. They prided themselves on their diversity They prided themselves on being very accepting of all kinds of lifestyles. They were economically prosperous. They were religiously pluralistic. There was a small pocket of a Jewish community, a traditional Jewish community in the city, but for the most part, it was a variety of Greco-Roman pagan religions that ruled the streets in that day. Then Paul and his companions showed up. Someone named Priscilla and her husband Aquila with Paul, showed up, and they began sharing Jesus over a period of about a year and a half, we learn in the book of Acts. And during that time, they establish and plant this Corinthian church that Paul is writing this letter to. But as much as Paul tried to set them on the right path, they appointed elders, appointed deacons, various types of leaders for the church, city religion is really, really hard. It's challenging to live in a city where often, we know this in Los Angeles, right? The core values of our faith, the core priorities of our faith, the core commitments of our faith are often at odds, not all the time, but many times strongly at odds with the core values of the people around us in our city or the priorities or the commitments of people in our city and can often run counter to our faith in Jesus. So, like often happens in our own day too, some of the folks in the Corinthian church, this church we're looking at, began to follow the ways and values and commitments of the non-Christian world that was around them. Paul tells us in this letter that led that division in the church led to lots of divisions in the church. Some following the way of the world led to all sorts of controversies. People were claiming that their spiritual leaders, their celebrity pastor, if you will, their celebrity apostle was better than that guy's celebrity apostle. And I'm for Apollos. And this person said, I'm for Paul. And it led to all kinds of divisions in the church we saw at the beginning of the letter. They boasted in worldly wisdom instead of in the cross of Christ and in godly wisdom, which is often foolishness to the world. They were defending people who embraced sexual activity outside the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. The Corinthian church was suing each other over various matters in the church. They had questions about marriage and singleness. Is one better than the other? What should I do if I'm in this state or that state? What about cultural and religious issues surrounding what we eat? What if I go over to a non-Christian friend's house and they invite me to say, here's this great steak. It was offered up to this God. Should I eat it? What about other forms of idolatry? What is proper in the worship gathering 
like this on a Sunday? What about how men and women are supposed to act together and interact in a service like this? What about spiritual gifts? Are some better than others? Which ones are proper to do in a public setting like this? Which ones are not? Is it okay for some of us to eat before everyone gets to the communion meal. Oh, did we mention also there were some people getting drunk during communion <laughs> before it happened? And then they also had some questions about the resurrection and how Jesus coming back is all going to go down. Whew. We went through all of that over these past 22 weeks. It's in our whole archive on YouTube or on iTunes or SoundCloud if you'd like to go either watch or listen to those. You can find it there if you missed any of those messages. But Paul again and again and again sought to show the Corinthians that Jesus and his ways are better than all the ways of the world. Jesus and his wisdom, his plans for our sexuality, his plans for singleness, his plans for marriage are always better than the world's. Why make it about following spiritual leaders when you have the leader in Christ? Why worry about idols when you worship the true one God? Seek to do all you can culturally so you can help other people meet Jesus and hear the good news. Oh, and let love be the supreme value in all you do every day, everywhere you go, including in the worship gathering like this. As we saw over the last couple weeks, he answered their questions about the resurrection to come and what good news it will be. Now, Paul closes his letter. He's got some greetings to make and some final instructions. So here's the key takeaway for this morning. I always give one main takeaway. It's the main thing you can take away from the message, hopefully, and what that thing was all about. It's on the back of your bulletin if you grabbed one. for the key. So the key takeaway for this morning, in the conclusion of his letter to the Corinthians, Paul reminds us that we are a universal church, we are to keep on in courageous faith and that we are all a spiritual family in Christ. Let me read it one more time. Pretty simple this morning. Three points like a good Baptist message should be. In the conclusion of his letter to the Corinthians, Paul reminds us, one, that we're a universal church. Two, to keep on in courageous faith. And three, that we're all a spiritual family in Christ. Let's see how that unfolds here together. There are a lot of details going on here. There's a lot of people mentioned here. We can't get into all of them. If you'd like a good uh, study Bible, we can make some recommendations for you that have some notes on who are all these people and things. We'll touch on a few of them, but let's get to that first point that I already mentioned. The first thing we see here, Paul reminds us that we are all, including the Corinthians, are a universal church. Notice in verse 1, Paul brings up a topic of some collection, he says, for the saints, which the Corinthians apparently already knew about somehow, and based on the context, would have understood what he was saying. So in verse 1, Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also you are to do. Paul then gives instructions on how to set aside money for this collection that he calls them to, so that when he arrives to see them, that collection, that amount of money that he's going to take to someone else, will be ready to go. We learn in verse 3 that this gift is intended to make it to Jerusalem. So what is this all about? What's going on here? Well, thankfully, we have several other references to this collection, this charitable event that's going on in 2 Corinthians. It happens in the next letter that we have as well. It's talked about in Romans. And it's also talked about in the historical narrative of the book of Acts. It was a collection from the Gentile churches, so mainly non-Jewish uh, churches, around the Roman Empire, like Corinth, who were apparently, for whatever reason, more financially prosperous. It was a gift then directed to the predominantly Jewish Christian churches in and around Jerusalem at the time, where the church, of course, first started not long after Jesus ascended back to heaven. For reasons that aren't necessarily spelled out in the New Testament, the Jewish churches were socioeconomically more disadvantaged than their Gentile counterparts. Paul nor any other New Testament writer ever mentions that this is owning to the Jewish Christian's own fault, right? But it was a reality nonetheless. So what is Paul's response then? for this need that he sees in the Jerusalem churches. Well, 
their independent churches, let them pay for their own needs, right? Let them take care of themselves. Why should they burden other churches, especially ones that are far away from them? It's not the Gentile church's fault that they are wealthier. In fact, it might be a commendation that they are wealthier, right? Perhaps the Gentile Christians have worked harder and been more responsible than these Jewish churches. That's not his response at all, is it? What is his response? He directs all the Gentile churches that he's been a part of and that he's connected to to begin to set aside weekly on the day the church gathers money for a gift to be sent to the Jerusalem churches that he plans to deliver personally himself as a gift from these churches. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? What's significant about collecting it on the day that the church gathers? That means it's not just kind of this random charitable thing that on the side, like during the week, oh yeah, you need to put, a, put aside a little. Paul is making it part of the worship gathering itself, showing the way you are generous to your brothers and sisters in need is a reflection of your worship to God. It's one of the reasons we also do our collection. We say every day, every Sunday in here, you can give a gift today. It's a natural extension of our worship to God. From the other sections of the New Testament which reference this collection, we know it eventually does happen. It eventually gets to the Jewish churches in Jerusalem. And that Paul uses an argument for the collection by saying they are all part of a universal body of Christ together. Gentiles and Jews alike. You see this theme pop up quite a bit. You see it in Ephesians, uh, especially in Galatians, that Jew, the, one of the good news results of the gospel is that Jews and Gentiles, ethnically and religiously different people, come together as one in Christ. They are not, ultimately, the church in Jerusalem, the church in Corinth, the church in Antioch, the church in Ephesus, they are ultimately the church of Jesus Christ. Thus, they share responsibility to provide for one another as each has need. Now, things today are a little more complicated, right? It's been about 2,000 years since this time here. A lot of stuff has happened. The universal church of Jesus Christ is still just as much a fundamental truth. We believe, you know, obviously, hopefully, we are not the only true followers of Jesus on the earth, and there are a lot of other places, uh, not just in our state, our city, our country, but in the entire world where there are people who genuinely love Jesus and are part of this universal church of Jesus Christ. But there are lots of denominations now. There are tons of splits that have happened over 2,000 years of church history. Some of those splits have happened for very good reasons. Some of those splits have happened for very bad reasons, probably. But I will say this. One reason we, so it makes it complicated for all, because all those splits, you can't just all say, oh, let's all make one big pot together. But I will say one reason we choose co to cooperate with our network of various Baptist churches. And by the way, uh, us, as a particular member of a Baptist network of churches, our church looks very different than some other churches, okay? I know there are, like, Baptist cowboy churches, all right? So, like, everybody dressed up in a cowboy hat and in cowboy boots, singing cowboy worship songs and, and dunking people in the name of Jesus and worshiping that way. Not exactly what we do here, right? There's some people with very different accents than mine. There are, as last I heard, I heard this a couple years ago, just of our network of churches in the city of Los Angeles, maybe in the county too, there are something like 90 churches uh, that 90 different languages that are spoken in our network of churches. So we don't just speak English in our network of churches. There are very different ones, but why do we choose to cooperate together? Well, it's because of this principle we see here. We are part of the universal body of Christ. When one has need, we share with the other as well. The way we do this in our network of Great Commission Baptist churches is through something called the cooperative program. And how it works, it, there, there are essentially needs that poor churches have. There are needs for pastors. There are needs for pastoral training. There are needs for leadership training, theological development. There are needs for church planting and starting new churches, which lots of other people helped us do back in 2012 when we started this 
whole thing. There are needs for missionaries and people to be sent all over the world and cross cultures and learn different languages so they can share the good news in other places. There are needs to help orphans and those who are without fathers and mothers around the world in the name of Jesus. There are needs for protecting the abused and survivors as we have learned if you've been keeping up with some of the issues going on in our own network of churches. We are a small church, obviously. We are poor. We're not poor uh, ourselves, but we are poor compared to, say, a mega church in our network. But when we corrupt, cooperate. When you give to Anthology Church, a percentage of that goes to our state network, which goes to the wider network, which goes out into all the needs of our country and our world. When we do that, we are helping to provide for the needs of other churches. When other bigger churches do that as well, they're helping to provide for our needs and others around the world in this very way that Paul is talking about and encouraging the Corinthians to do. They provide for our needs. We provide for theirs. Why? Because we are a universal church of Jesus Christ, all responsible for one another. So that's the first thing Paul reminds us of. We're a universal church. Second thing, we must keep on in courageous faith together. Between verses 5 and 12, Paul makes mention of his own plans to once again visit the Corinthians, right? He says, I want to come and see you. He mentions also two dear companions of his who are in the church in Corinth, or who those in the church in Corinth would have been familiar with. We hear of his dear companion, Timothy, who he also wrote a couple letters to, if you're familiar with 1st and 2nd Timothy, who is planning on visiting Corinth sometime soon. Very funny kind of mention, right? At least it seems, reads funny to me. Paul mentions Apollos, who the church was, who was already talked about in the letter before this. He was one of the people that people were saying, I follow Apollos, and he's better than all your other People. Well, Paul mentions Paul, says, I urged him to come to see you, but he's not coming now. And, and you're kind of go, what, what's going on here? He's not coming. Paul doesn't say. We don't know. Maybe they would know, but it's kind of a funny mention. It, it almost reads to me like, I told Apollos to come to you guys. The fact that he's not coming, it's not my fault, okay? just It's on Apollos. I don't know what his deal is right now, but perhaps it has to do with the factions that they we're having. But he says he's not able to visit yet, but you just get this, you get this picture, it's so personal, right? These are so many interesting things here, interpersonal details that 2,000 years away from them don't really make sense to us, but probably made sense to the people in that day. But then we get to verses 14, 13 and 14. And verses 13 or 14 are probably the best way to sum up the entire book. Here's what it says. I'll read it for us, because this is probably, if you were to take one theme verse from 1 Corinthians, this is it. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. That's what this whole letter has essentially been about, really. The young church has to remember it's not just a one-time decision to place your faith in Jesus that matters. They must keep on in sincere faith in Christ. They must stand firm, as Paul says here. They must not turn to the wisdom of the world. They must trust in the quote-unquote foolishness of the cross and the wisdom of God. They must not look to celebrity pastors or leaders that they would seek to follow and divide themselves into different factions, but look to the chief shepherd together, Jesus Christ himself. They must throw off all the ways of living that the world promotes, which are outside of the ethical and moral character of the one who is always ethical, whether it be in the sexuality reign, whether it be in idolatry, whether it be in how you live out your faith in your neighborhood, in the city to which God has called you. Their Sunday worship gatherings shouldn't be defined by showing off their gifts, but defined by love and welcoming the outsider to understand the good news of Jesus as best they can. This takes being wise, right? This takes being watchful. It takes discipline in our faith. It takes standing firm in who we are. I think when I think of standing firm, being watchful, being strong, there was a game that my uh, cousins and I would play all the time when we would go to the beach. We typically went down to uh, Carlsbad and went camping on the beach in August or so. Had some great memories I can look back on with my cousin. We would play this game where we would go down about as far as we could, maybe about waist high into the waves, and turn around and face the shore. What we would attempt to do, we'd play this game where we would attempt to stay as still as we can as the waves crashed 
in on us from the back. And then, you know, as the, as the suction from the waves going back takes you back, we tried as much as we can to like stay still. And whoever, w the person that won the game was the last person that fell over. So the others were all sitting there trying to hold on and then someone would fall over we'd go, ah, ha, ha, and then get hit by a wave and uh, we would crash over. But we were attempting to stand firm as the waves and the pressures were coming in and coming out. I, that's a picture, I think, of what Paul is mentioning here. That's what being in a city, being in a world that often has values outside of what it means to follow Jesus, we are called to stand firm as the pressures come and keep our faith firmly planted in Christ, not shifting, not depending on our own strength, but depending on the Holy Spirit and God's strength for us. We are to stand firm. We are to resist the tides. We are to place ourselves firmly in Jesus. This takes courage. It takes perseverance. The phrase from the ESV here that's translated act like men, that's the version we're using here today and usually use. I think it's probably translated better. Some other versions translate this way, act courageously, because it seems clear here from the context, Paul is not just talking to the men in the congregation here. He's probably talking to everyone. It could be translated that way as well as some of them do. He also stressed so eloquently in chapter 13, everything that we do as followers of Jesus must be led and motivated by love. It must be superseded. It must be the whole ethical undergirding surrounding everything we do. Paul says, let all that you do be done in love. So first, Paul reminds us we're a universal church. Second, Paul reminds us we must keep on in courageous faith. Third, Paul reminds us that we're all a spiritual family together. The way that Paul ends this letter circles back in many ways to the very first thing he said that we talked about, about being a universal church, but he drives it home more now with affectionate terms, right? With kind of feeling here together and how we care for one another. We are not just a church. If you've been a part of Anthology for a while, if you've been with us, been a member, if you're a guest here, we're so glad you are here or you're watching online. We hope you can join us and be a part of what it looks like to explore and follow Jesus. But if you're a regular or you certainly if you're a member of Anthology, we are not just a one-hour, 15-minute gathering once a week, including other things like community groups and occasionally potlucks when we are able to. We're not merely a club that gathers on Sundays and other times during the week. Paul says we're a spiritual family. In verses 15 through 18, Paul mentions three Corinthians who had come from Corinth to visit him and give a report on the status of the church. He was encouraged by their faith and their work in the Lord, and he wants to remind the Corinthians to follow their good example. Then look at verse 19. He says, the churches in Asia send your, you greetings. Aquila and Prisca together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers and sisters send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Paul writes this letter, we believe, and are pretty convinced of, from Ephesus in what is now modern-day Turkey. The Asian churches he mentions here are the churches spread throughout modern-day Turkey, would have included several others that are also mentioned in the New Testament. Corinth, of course, is a part of modern-day Greece, and so it was across the sea from where Paul is writing this letter. But Paul says, even though you're a sea away, there are lots of people that love you and care for you. You are a spiritual family together, and you need to treat one another like that. He mentions Aquila and Prisca, who the church would have had dear affection for as those who, along with Paul, first helped start the church back years ago or however long it's been since they started. This is the only time Aquila in the New Testament, the husband of this ministry couple, they're always mentioned together. It's really kind of neat how it happens. It's the only time Aquila is mentioned before his wife Prisca, or in other places is called Priscilla, uh, showing that Priscilla was either of such great stature, social stature, or Perhaps more likely, she was so significant to the ministry, probably a little more affectious, uh, um, uh, effective perhaps than her husband or much more influential that she was almost all the other times mentioned before him. We don't know what the reason is, but it is significant. She's mentioned before, especially in that culture. But they would have had great affection for him. And when Paul says, they send you greetings, uh, they, it would have meant so much to the Corinthians. 
they were so influential now that apparently whatever they'd moved on to Ephesus and the church there is meeting in their home in Ephesus. And Paul mentions that the whole church that's in their home sends not just greetings, but hearty greetings. They send love to the Corinthians. Indeed, he says, all the brothers and sisters send them greetings. Again, I wish the ESV would translate the word Adelphoi, which is the word for brothers and sisters here, as inclusive because it clearly includes more than just uh, more than just the men in the church. Brothers and sisters is definitely intended for our context and our understanding. They are a spiritual family. Just calling each other brothers and sisters means so much if you really think about it. It can get so cliche if you've been in churches for a while, that we, but we are united under one spiritual father and one Lord. Even across the sea, they are members of one another. And now, even across 2,000 years of history, we are members of them. And now a command that we, of course, all have to practice from now on out. We have to greet one another with a holy kiss because it's in the Bible. Okay, so get ready, everyone. Not COVID safe. (laughs) No, I kid. This is clearly a a cultural custom and one that doesn't need to be carried out during global pandemics especially. But this would not be that strange if you've been to a lot of Middle Eastern countries. There are a lot of places where even men to men do greetings. I spent lots of time in uh, Latin American countries, a year in Brazil, been to Dominican Republic, Mexico, very common pre-COVID to <laughs> greet, greet someone anytime a man met a woman or a woman met a woman, you would greet with a, a beso or a beju in uh, Brazil and Portuguese on the cheek. And depending on where you go, it could be one, two, and then some places they get really crazy. You could do one, two, three from cheek to cheek a lot. Very fun. I tell you what, I, I, you get used to it. It does mean a lot. It is so much more uh, affectious to do that, and that's probably what Paul intends here. For on context, we're Americans, and it's during a global pandemic too. So we got to you know, keep the distance here so we're all doing okay. But it means greet one another in a way that shows affection. Greet one another in a way as your brothers and sisters in Christ to know you care for one another. Be affectionate with one another as a good family is together and should be. Paul closes the letter by telling them that he writes this farewell with his own hand. Isn't that kind of a neat little point at the very end here? A nice personal touch, meaning the rest of the letter was probably written, uh, dictated by him to another, something called an amnes... I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. Amnesis. That means someone who dictates exactly what you write word for word. That's probably what was going on here. Paul doesn't mention who that is in this context. There may be some other places from the letter we could have some clues. But here, Paul says... Let me take the pen myself and let me close this letter out and say, I, Paul, am writing to you. I want you to know, as your spiritual father of sorts, as someone who's helped start this church with you, that I myself care for you and I love you and I hope to see you soon. That is 1 Corinthians. We did the entire letter together, 22 weeks, all summed up in be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act courageously, Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. I think one of the things that I love to see about letters like this is the reminder, not just are we a personal people, we're a family, we are Uh, people that are to show affection. We are brothers and sisters of one another. We have spiritual fathers and mothers, and of course we have one God and Father and one Lord above all. But God, it reminds us, you're a personal God. You are a God that's not just distant and removed. You're an affectionate God. You're a loving God. You're a personal God. Thank you most of all. We see that displayed in Christ himself, the one who came down, from heaven, the one who wept when there was great sadness, when there was death, when he saw suffering, the one who bent down with children, looked them in the eye, the one who sat with sinners and others that were too far gone for the culture. Thank you, Lord, that you showed us the ultimate example of how personal you are. Lord, teach us to care for one another. Teach us that we're a part of a universal church together, that we're a spiritual family, and help us to stand firm and be courageous in the faith together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.